pray. Oh God, we ask that you come close to us this morning so we can look at your word for us this day so it will bless our hearts and minds and our very souls. And may it transform us by your grace. For we ask it in your son's name. Amen. You, you saw me wave when my grandson was down here and he was waving at Papa and <laughs> Papa was waving back. And it's funny that Papa waves to grandson and all the children wave back to the preacher, <laughs> which is pretty cool too. So. Uh, Lee, a seven-year-old boy, was asked to say things for the Christmas, uh, for the Christmas dinner. I mean, not say things, give thanks for the Christmas dinner. And the family members bowed their heads in expectation because he had never done this before. And uh, he started uh, praying, thanking God for his mommy and his daddy and for all the grandparents and his cousins. And he thanked God for his aunts and uncles. Then he began to thank God for the food. He thanked God for the turkey and for the ham and for the stuffing and the pudding and the cranberry dressing and the green beans and the cream corn. And it just went on and on and on. And then there was this long pause. And it lasted for an entire minute. Then it goes into the second minute. And finally, he opens an eye and he looks up to his mother and he says, Mommy, if I thank God for Brussels sprouts, will he think I'm lying? <laughs> kind of with him there, but uh, the sermon today is about blessing. Don't you sometimes have a great day? I know some of you may struggle with that. But sometimes, every now and then, we have a great day, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. We wake up and we just, for some reason, it just feels happier than another day. The sun's bright. We rested well. The arthritis is not quite as achy today. You know, and things just start going great. Maybe you get a, a text message from a child that you haven't heard for, from in two weeks. You know, or, you know, just different kinds of things. And you just want to break out in song. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. It doesn't happen all that often. But when it does, what a great treasure it is. When it does... What a blessing. We just wish it would happen a little more often, don't we? In our text this morning, Mary is having that kind of day. We can hear it in her words. It actually begins with Elizabeth. You know, a distant family member. Both are pregnant. Mary a little, little um, less bigger than uh, uh, her uh, I mean, Elizabeth a little bigger than Mary, but both are pregnant. Both of them uh, are going to deliver in a few months. And Elizabeth, again, is much older than Mary, and she's wanted children all of her life. And then that, that shadowy figure whispers into her husband's ear and tells, her, tells him of this great news. He's going to be a father. And he shouts out into the shadows, at her age? You've got to be kidding me. And the angel was not too impressed. The angel strikes him kind of deaf and dumb. He can't talk for a while. I guess I wouldn't be able to talk for a while anyway. But uh, then the winged creature struck Zechariah deaf, and it took him a while before he could come to grips that he was actually going to be dad. Now, when Mary arrives on the doorsteps of Elizabeth to talk, you would think that Elizabeth being so advanced in years and not having a child for so long and then uh, now being pregnant and certain that she's going to have a child, that when Mary gets on those front steps, she would dominate the conversation. She would start talking about what she wants for her son, uh, what name she's going to marry, uh, name him, and uh, the places that she would want him to go and the things she would want him to do. But Elizabeth doesn't do that. Maybe that's where John got the, the model of being second fiddle and being okay with it from Elizabeth, his mother. 
She doesn't do that. She says to Mary, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. Can you hear the excitement in the voice? She's ready to break out. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Pure joy. She's filled with the Spirit of God. She's inspired. She's happy. The Spirit of God, uh, that the presence of God that is growing in Mary's womb is the Lord of this world and is going to be the light of this world. Then Mary makes her beautiful response. Back to Elizabeth. Listen to her joy. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he, is, uh, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Wow. Elizabeth is excited. Mary's excited. And frankly, I get a little excited when I read this too. There's something infectious about it. Have you ever been around people that that just infect you with happiness? No? Yeah? No. No. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that you do. I, I hope there are people out there like that, that you just, when you get around them, you just sense their joy. You just sense their happiness. There's, there's a few people in my life like that. When I feel like I have to reach up to scratch a grasshopper's belly, there's some people in my life that I can just sit down beside. And sometimes there's, there's no words exchanged. And I just feel better by being around them. I feel good about being in their presence. It just, it just oozes the joy out of them. And you want to be around them all the time if you can. Um, I get excited about this story. I get excited for us all because their story is not just their story. Their story is our story as well. Their story shows us Just what can happen when God touches a life. When God reaches into human history and touches an ordinary life, God can turn it into an extraordinary existence. Extraordinary. Now, don't misunderstand I know there's never going to be another mother of John the Baptist. There's never going to be another mother uh, of Jesus. They were each one of a kind. However, God still touches lives. God still blesses people. God still chooses people. Many times, according to the Bible, most of the time, the most unlikely people to give a blessing that ends up becoming a blessing blessing for others, many others. You know, I believe I'm one of those. I believe you are one of those. I believe we are one of those. I think God has blessed us and is continually blessing us so we can go take that blessing we have received and go on and bless other people as well. Now, don't misunderstand this either. I'm not talking about this blessing being like winning the lottery or this blessing comes to us and all of a sudden uh, all of our roads are smooth, there's no potholes, there are no speed bumps, there are no curves, no hills, no valleys. You know, in fact, the blessing of God is seldom very easy or comfortable. For instance, you know, neither Elizabeth or Mary 
had an easy birth, think about where those two boys were born. It wasn't antiseptic. It wasn't sterile. You know, one of them's in a stable among critters. The other one was probably in a dusty, dingy back room of a house. Oh no, both of these mothers would eventually also lose their boys to the ministry of God. Then, because of their ministry, they would lose them to life. One to a chopping block, and the other one to a cross. No, God doesn't bless us to fill our sails with a constant breeze, making our paths smooth and straight. God does not call us to lives of ease or comfort. God calls us to lives that matter. God calls us to lives that have purpose. God calls us to lives worth living. Lives that become a blessing for other people. Have you ever longed for a blessing? Huh? Have you ever longed for a blessing and then not receive it? Maybe you were an athlete and and you you had this particular coach and you loved that coach, you respected that coach, and you tried hard and and you, you tried to get better and you did this and you did that, but that coach never said, good job. That's great. You're good at what you do. You're the best linebacker in the county. Yeah, we ache. We ache for a blessing. We ache for a blessing from other people. Two year, um, several years ago, two psychologists who considered themselves Christian psychologists wrote a little book uh, they entitled The Blessing. And the book was given to me many years ago. And in that book, they tell the story of a young man by the name of Brian. And Brian was the son of a a Marine officer. And his dad wanted Brian to become a Marine officer as well. And it sounds like something from from the great Santini. But uh, uh, Brian's dad was very strict, a disciplinarian, and Brian could do nothing right. He never received a compliment from his father. There were no warm and fuzzies. There were no hugs. There were no that boys or, you know, no encouragement whatsoever. Always stern discipline. So when Brian turns 18 years old and he joins the Marines, the father says it was the best day of his life. Brian says it was the worst day of his life. And Brian goes off to Paris Island and immediately gets into trouble because Paris Island represented his dad. So immediately he begins rebelling against the authority and eventually he gets into a fist fight with his drill instructor, which is a no-no. And he's dishonorably discharged. His father tells him not to come home. That he's ashamed of him and ends the conversation by telling Brian that he is now dead to him. He no longer has a father, and he no longer has a son. Don't try to come home. So Brian goes from town to town taking odd jobs, and Brian had a very good mind. He was very smart, but he took menial jobs from town to town trying to exist, and and every now and then he would would, uh, meet a young woman, and they would fall in love, and uh, several times right before the wedding, he ran. He could not... uh, commit. He ran from, from, the, from the wedding. After about 10 or 12 years, a friend of Brian's contacted him, found him, and told him that his father was dying. And Brian decided he was going to go see his dad, and maybe, just maybe, if he, he went to see his dad, his dad could give him what he hasn't received, the blessing. And Brian gets on a Trailways bus, and you know Trailways bus don't go as fast as a jet airplane. And by the time Brian got home, his father had already died. So Brian never received what he wanted the most, or what he needed the most. Now I think 
we all have some of Brian in us. We long for the blessing. We long for the blessing of our family. You know, we want our mother and our father to bless us. We want to bless our children. We want to bless our grandchildren. And we want our children to bless us back as well. It goes on and on and on. Uh, We want to know to somebody on this planet that we have value that we're respected, that they think we have self-worth, that we're valuable as a person. Now, some of us, most of us probably didn't get it because our parents didn't know how to give it, and they didn't know how to give it because they didn't get it. And that's not pointing fault. That's just the way it was. But we need it. We need that blessing. Now, we may not have gotten it from our parents or our grandparents or, or our coach or our teacher or some other figure. They may not have known how to do any of that. But God gives it to us. God gave it to Mary and God gave it to Elizabeth. And God does not bless us into an easy life of comfort, but God blesses us into a life of meaning and purpose, a life that will be blessing to the lives of others. Yes, God blesses us, to turn us into a blessing. You know, God didn't bless Elizabeth and Mary and just left it there. It wasn't, it just didn't stay there in in the birthing room. Both Mary and Elizabeth became became blessings for the world. You know, as you think in history, people like Mother Teresa, you know, she was blessed with a tender heart a selfless heart, then God sent her over into India, into the most impoverished situations, and she became a blessing for thousands of Indian people. God called a little woman named Mamie Lee McClure that I knew very well. She was about that tall, and she had a little rusted-out maverick. And when you saw her coming, you, you ran in that car because you could only see the eyeballs between the steering wheel and the dash. She drove like this. Scary. But Mamie Lee was called to be the wife of a farmer. She was called to be the mother of three boys. She was called to be a member of this little church where she taught Sunday school for decades, where she rocked babies that were sick so mommies and dads could go to worship. She baked little chocolate brownies, oatmeal cookies, not brownies, oatmeal cookies, and gave them to every visitor that would come to that church. And I can't tell you how many people joined that church because of Mamie Lee McClure's chocolate oatmeal cookies. She was blessed. But my, oh my, what a blessing she was for others. At the age of 16, Andor Folds was already a skilled pianist. He made his public debut performing a Mozart concerto with the Budapest Philharmonic when he was about eight years old. But at 16, he was having a lot of severe emotional uh, problems, deeper than most 16-year-olds. Then one of Europe's most renowned pianists came to Budapest, Emil von Sauer. And he was famous not only for his abilities, but for being the only surviving student of Franz Litz, the greatest of the great. Now, Sauer had heard about this young 16-year-old Folds and asked to hear him. He wanted to uh, hear him play. And, um, And Folds, even though he was emotionally drained by his personal problems, he took some of the most difficult pieces of Bach and Beethoven and Schumann, and he played them flawlessly for this uh, expert. And when he finished it in about an hour, and he covered the keys, Sauer stood up from his chair, and he walked across the floor, and he met Folds there on on the bench. And he leaned over, 
and he took folds by the chin like this and then he leaned over and kissed him on the forehead and folds was just shocked couldn't believe what had just taken place and then sour said to him these words my son when I was a young man, I was a student of Litz, and he kissed me on the forehead one day after I played for him. He said to me, son, take good care of this kiss. It comes from Beethoven, who gave it to me when I was a young man after listening to me play. I have waited nearly a lifetime to pass on this sacred heritage, but I believe you deserve it. And with that kiss, with that blessing, Fold ceased thinking about suicide and blessed thousands, thousands of people with his talent. You know, in 1913, Albert Schweitzer, a physician, a renowned organist and pianist, gave up a glamorous life in Germany to go to, go to Africa to work as a, a medical missionary, and his first clinic was in a chicken coop. And his bed, his bed was a, a, just a, a, a cot, a military cot. And in 1949, Switzer came to the United States, and a reporter caught up with him and asked Dr. Switzer, uh, Dr. Switzer, uh, have you found happiness in your life? And Switzer said, I found a place to serve God, and that should be enough happiness for everybody or anybody. I have found a place to serve God, and that should be enough happiness for anybody or everybody. Now, I don't know what God's called you to do, whether you're 9 or 90. You may not know. But what I do know is that whether we are 9 or 90, God has blessed us and calls us, each one of us, to be a blessing as well. Being a blessing usually isn't easy. It's hard. It will cost you time. It will cost you energy. You may get your feelings hurt, hurt often. There will be times when you feel you're more of a failure than you are a success. The guarantee is this, though. You will have meaning. You will have purpose. You will have personal self-worth. You will have value. You will have a life that's worth living because you have given that life back to the holy. Live out the blessing of Christ, of, that Christ has given you. Live out the blessing that God has given you. And you will be able to say with Mary these words. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy, holy is his name. Amen.